welcome back to those of you who have been a Bridge Club participant before. And to those of you who are brand new, welcome. We're happy to have you here. A couple real quick things for those of you who are new. Um, we want to tell you a little bit about the Bridge Club. It is um, TED Talks plus a uh, good old fashioned book club plus a little bit of a networking event. Um, we're hoping we're here to connect, engage, learn, and grow. Those are the four tenets of our company. And um, Catherine Haskins and I created the, the Bridge Club originally to get people together over really interesting conversations. And we are thrilled that this is number 25 conversation <laughs> since we launched in February of this year. So we are doing a boatload of talking and appreciate all of you um, come to participate today. So a couple things too, we do things a little differently around here. This session is being recorded and those who are all access members will receive a, a copy of the recording after we finish up today. So you can view this at your leisure over and over and over again. If you're not an all access member, you certainly can become one. Just go to our website and check it out there. Um, and we want to hear from everybody here. So when you're not talking, if it gets a little noisy, you notice some noise, go ahead and mute yourself. And then feel free to unmute when you want to make a comment um, or have something that you want to share or want to ask a question. So the most important part of this is that you turn on your camera so we can see your smiling faces. This whole thing is about engagement. It's about looking at each other and talking with each other, not at each other. So um, as I always say, this is not a webinar. This is a conversation. So in order to have a conversation, it's really nice when you can see each other's faces. So. If uh, those of you who are able, please do turn on your camera so we can see you. Um, so we have a really cool host today. I'm really excited that Carrie said yes to doing this with us. She has an amazing um, history of creating the future while those of us, uh, most of us actually are sitting around kind of still mapping out our plan for today. So um, it's really fun to have Carrie here to talk about um, the next thing that she sees on the horizon. And um, even more than that, she really brings a really huge appreciation for life into everything that she does. And always, uh, I always walk away with a lot of energy. I hope you will as well today. So um, grab your beverage. The Bridge Club is happy to announce Dr. Carrie Marshall, who will be our guest host for today. Carrie. Cheers to all of you who are bridging the future. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. All right, uh, so this is going to be really fun, and I'm going to kick it off with, uh, with a vote, and Catherine and Brenda, you'll have to help me keep tally here, because I'm going to take a vote before we give a framework, uh, and then maybe we'll do one after if we have time. But I want to know, um, who owns the pet medical record? How many of you, raise your hand, think it's the veterinarian? Raise your hand. So for those of you that we can't see your screen, you can put it in the chat room. So that way we can do it that way too. Good idea, Catherine. So raise your hand now for veterinarian. Okay, uh, who, who believes it's the pet owner who owns the pet medical record? Raise your hand. Okay. And who believes that maybe it's, they haven't decided yet? That it's kind of up for play. Who believes it's the pet? <laughs> <laughs> that day's coming. <laughs> okay, so we got our poll. It looks like there's more pet owners than I thought, because of course this is the, a group of the future. So, um, you know, in human health care, it's been changing. Um, and it's been changing for different reasons, I believe, than than how veterinary medicine is evolving. So human healthcare is consumer-driven healthcare, but it really isn't consumer-driven healthcare. It's how to drive healthcare costs down by uh, making the consumer absorb more of those costs. That's what consumer-driven healthcare really is. But it spurred the idea of exchange medical records, facilitated it, and you can, um, for, for the exchange of medical records, you can uh, then share medical records more easily and they're more portable. And then with the rising specialty groups and emergency hospitals and the rising uh, knowledge of pet parents, it's been really interesting to watch uh, um, how we're evolving to fit that pet parent's mind. So, um, and then there's a whole controversy about pet parent versus pet owner. I choose pet parent. Um, I realize there are legal ramifications and I'm 
I think that we can't have both, both, have it both ways. So I think they think of themselves as a pet parent. So there's three things that I believe are driving this change towards pet parents owning their records. And I, I want to hear from each of you on these things. And I'll show you the, the framework and then we'll have this discussion around that. So tell me if this, you can see this. If you guys want to quickly, quickly go to speaker view instead of your um, um, gallery view, you'll be able to, to see what Carrie's holding up there. So if you can't see it, what I'm holding up is just a picture of you know who owns the pet medical record and what the three things in the framework I believe are driving a, a dramatic shift. Um, so culture change, and I call it customer-driven healthcare. I don't like consumer-driven healthcare because it's got negative in implications from human health. Um, connect, support, and inform um, culture, which is really about the experience. Um, so let me let me talk to you a little bit about that. So just just to kind of stimulate uh, your thought process around culture change. So sharing sharing records is not just between specialty hospitals and emergency hospitals and your primary care anymore. Um, it also includes pet sitters, boarding, grooming, training. You know, those are big pieces of that pet's life and arguably they go to daycare way more than they go to the veterinarian. And so you should be looped in um, to that, that. So that culture changes saying, hey, my medical records need to go outside the veterinary community as well, so I need to own them. The second thing, and this is part of a larger economy called the sharing economy. Uh, the second thing is experience. It's just a better client experience, and it certainly would be much better in healthcare if you could take you, yours or your parents' uh, or your kids' records around with you what, to whatever provider and rather than taking 30 days to transfer in between facilities, which is the law, we could do it within minutes. Um, and so that's, and people are looking now, uh, this new generation, and it started with Disney, like your practice has to be like Disney. So now it's, um, people are buying experiences. They're not buying products and services anymore. So you can't position your practice anymore as a product and service. It's an experience and part of that experience has to be digital. And so that's really allowed a lot of freedom um, in the pet parent's mind. Um, but the, it also has shifted the responsibility then a little bit over to the pet parent. So we're no longer the hero, we're the guide. And that's a really important shift to understand. And that's what digital technology has allowed them to get a lot more information, whether it's right or wrong information they're getting a lot more information outside of the purview of veterinarians unless we start to engage digitally so that's the piece the third piece which is knowledge economies there's so much information out there right i mean there's there's genomics there is a dr google out there there's everything um so our role is so important as the trusted advisor and guide to these pet parents in every step that they care for the pet. That means we have to move our relationship outside of the hospital and into the homes. And that means if they own the medical records, we're the translator for them. You can own something like, a, you know, I own, I own horses. I pretty much understand them. I own cars. I don't. You know, I have to go get a translator for what the heck is this light mean, right? So we're the translator, then, and this is a knowledge economy. We translate that knowledge and the information that technology transforms into knowledge, we transform into wisdom. So those two yeah. things, I believe, have caused this change. And what I'd like to know from, from the group is anybody who... Um, there is still an argument for veterinarians owning records, right? Because of the, the um, education that we have and the, um, you know, the, uh, if you take, take an x-ray and then shop it around Google, you might actually harm the pet, right? So there is this argument, but does anybody have some better arguments about veterinarians owning those records? 
Because legally, it's still the veterinarian owns the records legally, right? There's one state, I think, that, um, that they don't. So, um, so, you know, we've got some work to do here if the, if the group thinks very differently than, than where we are legislatively and legally. Do you so think, Carrie, oh, I was going to ask you this question too, like, you know, why, why you thought there was such a fight, you know, over the ownership of, of the records. Do you think it's a fear of loss of control and fear of revenue that drives so many practices to hold on so tight? Yeah, I think, I think there's many reasons. I think that may be some people's reasons. There's always those hospitals and hospital owners that are very much competitive. Uh, we're, we're all competitive. We get, you couldn't get into vet school if you weren't competitive. So we carry that out in, into various forms that either help or hurt us. But, um, and, and innovation spurs is spurred by competitiveness. But I think it's more than that. I think it's, we have, I think as a group, veterinarians have a sense of responsibility. Like we, we take on more responsibility for that pet than the pet parent does. And I think that's what has to change. We have to say in our minds that the pet parent has responsibility for their pet. And we have the responsibility to get them information and then to help guide them through that myriad of information to result in the very best care. And I'm not saying just medicine, it's care for their pet. We have to expand our, our realm and we have to get in there and guide. And I see a lot of heads nodding. Does anybody have any specific questions or anything that's coming to mind as Carrie is discussing some of these issues here or the, the question of, of responsibility? One of the things that I was thinking um, as a technician, um, you know, when we write in records, sometimes things aren't always written correctly or is somebody missing, you know, somebody yeah. can misinterpret what's written in the record. And, um, and I believe that could be one of the, one of the issues too, you know? So one of my questions was going to be, okay, if, if we're, when we're sharing information, because I know as a pet owner, I like to have copies of my blood work and that, and uh, any reports and any of that kind of stuff. But are the, are the narratives of the veterinarians exempted? Can they be exempted? Should they be exempted? Um, those kinds of things. Um, what it can can we separate what we what the parents can get and what should stay in house? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And to uh, kind of preface that, I worked at the UC Davis Primate Center for two and a half years and our records were public. So we had actual training and what we should and shouldn't write in the medical record and how it should be written because it could be in the front page of the Sacramento Bee, which of course they were in the Monkey Wars articles. So, um, so yes, certainly with technology, I think it's gonna be a journey. And I think that's the journey most companies like mine, Apple Bark are, are taking is, hey, vaccine, nobody has any problem releasing vaccination records. In fact, that makes your job easier if it's all there. You don't have to, don't have to call you for them. Um, nobody has any problems with that. Nobody's any problems with the appointments. I'm coming in for a wellness appointment or I'm, I've been to a grooming appointment and all of that. It's more like the biopsies and some of the lab work, you might want to have a conversation with the results in front of them rather than just having them see the results and freak out. Um, but I see it moving in human healthcare. I mean, my, get my results as they come in right into my, my chart on Epic and my doctors have to hustle if they want to call me first um, to get that. So, um, you know, I see that you can get there, but it didn't start that way on my chart. I've been in my chart for five years and I didn't get anything without talking to the doctor. <laughs> you know, they'd be, call your doctor and then you'll get all your results. And that, that probably just bogged them down. So they, they had to streamline it. So I think we'll be going along that journey of the veterinarian sends what they, they think. The problem with the journey is that when you go to an emergency hospital, you, there's no way the veterinarian can send the right records then. So what if you had some a biopsy uh, pending and that came in and the veterinarian was off that day and didn't send it to the client and they had, then the dog had a crisis. So those kind of cases, um, I think you should keep in mind as well, there's always consequences for these decisions and the rules that we make uh, on this journey. So I'm, I'm for pushing the journey along 
faster and and then getting the awareness up about how we write in medical records to your early point and then how we view um, sharing you know, what the client really has already paid for and bought. And maybe it's, maybe it's how the pathology report is written, maybe more client-friendly versions mm -hmm. and all of that, thinking about the whole ecosystem that's reading these. I think you're right. It's, it's, we, is everybody taught how to write in the record? What is what should be in the record? This is a legal document. What and 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 people forget that all the time. So every I think tra there there needs to be overall more training as far as what information it, do we put in the in the record and how do we put it? How do we how do we put it yeah, down? Frame it right because you know a lot of people put a client. Well, that doesn't mean a good one. Right, it means a hole, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're gonna have to change that, which also starts changing your culture to be more customer centric. Mm -hmm. I think right now we have a very team centric culture and veterinary centric, and everything's about my team. <clears throat> Some hospitals are farther on that customer centric journey than others. So it'll be easier because they wouldn't write those things anyway in the medical record, right? So it's, it's an internal culture change shift as well. Anybody else have any thoughts? I'm really interested in what you guys are thinking along this that might come up along this journey, or maybe you've already had some experiences with it. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll say this, uh, Carrie, uh, my entire 36 year career, I've had this experience. And that is making sure that the uh, the next person that sees that medical record, the next doctor, the next uh, team that's trying to help that pet knows exactly what I was thinking and knows exactly what we were telling the client. So there is an, so there is a continuity of care. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, that's the most important aspect of these medical records being available to the client. So if they do go to an emergency room in the middle of the night, that doctor knows what that pet is allergic to. That doctor knows what that pet's uh, been given. Uh, that that team knows what to expect from the history of that pet uh, before they start administering any treatments or recommending things to those uh, to the owner, that parent. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's the way I look at this whole concern uh, or this whole new trend is we have to have the that information available to the pet parent. Yes, but it's more more than that. It's got to be available to the next person that needs to make a life or death decision for that pet. Yes. Well said. I like the continuity of care. That's kind of a nice framework for us to think about it. Because you're, you know, it's not always just you that's going to see that pet. That's right. Um, the mobile world that we live in today, I mean, look at the people who are taking their pets everywhere they go. I mean, across continents, on airplanes, on trains. You know, at any given time, that pet could need you know, care or or even just routine care for those people who travel, you know, from from house to house over the course of time. It's it's coming, right? So I'd be curious to know, Carrie, like what kind of timeline do you see this all happening in? I mean, from your perspective, I know it can't come soon enough, but have you thought about how quickly you expect this change? No, just judging. This is an that's a really interesting question because I. I think thing, change comes a little bit slow to our profession, but I view this change, this digital um, change, it's not, it's not really from technology. This is from an economy change. Like I, that's how I framed it. And therefore, it's going to, have, it's going to be building. There's lots of uh, people that see it and are building for the future, and then suddenly people are going to grab it, and that's because People are going to start, and, it, and one of the vets at one of the conferences that I lectured at said it the best. I was lecturing on um, kind of this whole digital um, mobile practice, and she goes, well, I don't really think, want to think it's worth changing my practice to adopt some of these things. You know, they don't really need to do the appointments on the iPhone. They can call me. Well, they don't want, number one, they don't want to call you, right? Yeah. So I was just getting ready to answer her, her and kind of give some examples. And this guy was like waving his hand. And was like, so I let him, he's a very young veterinarian, just out of school. And he raised his hand and he said, hey, I'm a, I'm a vet, I'm a millennial, and I'm a pet parent. And he goes, I would travel across town for somebody that I could make an appointment, you know, on my phone. Yeah. And um, that's what's going to start happening. So the people that adopt these technologies will be very successful, and then the other ones will start to feel like taxis. 
And once that happens, the shift will happen. But I've already seen it happening, like a veterinary innovation summit last year. These conversations in the hallways are all about, you know, what is telehealth? What is telemedicine? How, you know, what should we, should we do it? And now the conversations in the hallway this year were how do we do this? Mm-hmm. It wasn't even should we do this? It's how do we do this? And then next year it'll be, well, this is what I've done and then I've done and I've done. This is the most successful approaches to integrating this into your practice. That's what's gonna, that's what's coming. So I think it's going to be fast as people adopt these new technologies. So I've got two things. One, you've got five minutes left. Second of <laughs> all, the, the one thing that I wanted to ask though is, okay, so if it's a consumer driven society, but we have regulations in this industry that are not allowing this, right? So mm-hmm. we have, I mean, where does AHA stand on this? Where does the AVMA, where does the state stand on this? Because we know from a telemedicine perspective with BCPRs, that's a problem, right? This is, mm-hmm. this is not gonna switch overnight. So can you give some point of view on, on where we stand there? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I haven't heard back yet from AHA. I've approached them several times over the last few months, so I believe they're probably mulling it over. And um, they do have officially, they are officially, their stance is that the veterinarian owns those records. And they worked very hard on that stance and very hard on that position. And it's at, in its time, it was right. But I think in the, the times change. And so uh, it will take some time to change the regulations. I think it will, it'll take clarifying the regulations and the interpretation of them. Um, I think a lot of it's uh, been around client privacy technology is, uh, you know, if you get the right technology, it's, it fits within the client privacy security. Um, you get, you want, it's, the technology has had to move towards allowing the client and the customer to sh- to say, yes, I want to share. Um, and that takes the liability off of those veterinary hospitals. There are lots of technologies early on that actually violated privacy and security law because they had the veterinarians give them their client base and then they sent advertising or marketing to the client base. So that's, that's against privacy law. The veterinarian doesn't own the client personal private information. Okay, so then it goes, and what do they own? Well, they did these medical records and it was their medical records. The veterinarian you know, wrote the medical records. But in my mind, the client paid for that. So if I paid for a consultation from my doctor, I would expect to own my, you know, my consultation and be able to take it anywhere with me. Um, so I think ownership is a, you know, how we interpret ownership is a, is, is kind of important. Um, and I, I think that I know the fight in the past was, um, like more against, um, I think Dr. Google than anything else. You know, we had this fear of all this information that's very, but I think it's, I think part of it is our culture. We, we don't connect well with training or trainers or groomers often because we judge them. And I think Kim Pope Robinson, through her training and her lectures out there, just she, she has nailed it on the head. To get into vet school, we had to be very competitive, as we said earlier. And we have this thing of name blame judge. But every time you do that with somebody, um, think, catch yourself at it. And I catch myself all the time, like I'm name blaming and judging that person. If you change that to, to recognize, um, embrace, connect and embrace, then your whole mindset is different about it. Um, so that's what I'm challenging people to do around this, this piece. The regulation, uh, we have to engage people that will go through regulations. I mean, obviously, um, Danny remembers uh, early days of Banfield. We were having a problem in California getting vet- enough veterinarians for our hospitals. My parents were having that problem, a lot of other vets, VCA. So we all banded together and did um, change the law on reciprocity and licensure by endorsement. So we, we got together as a profession and said, this is not right. We need more veterinarians. And of course, it's, a, it's almost an antitrust issue if there's no other reason to have such an onerous process to become licensed in the state. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there is going to be that to your point. There is going to be a journey here. 
I think the first part of the journey starts with a really good analysis uh, of the of the current laws, maybe a summary, um, and then and then the tackling it as we go. We kind of say, what, what do we want it to look like in the future? And that's a good segue, real quick here. I don't want to interrupt you here, but I, I know Martina has. Um, She's involved with the AVMLA and, and has a couple okay. of panels. I think oh, she that's great. That. Yeah, I'm so um, more qualified answers out there. <laughs> can you guys hear me? I'm not sure. Can yeah, you, yeah, we can hear you. So the American Vet Med Law Association, which is being held in conjunction with AVMA, is going to have a full day on telemedicine and mm -hmm. telehealth. So if you're not already registered for AVMLA and you can come, it's Saturday and Sunday. Please, please, please consider coming. We're going to cover some very important topics with some new speakers. We are going to have some one guy that was doing the Alexa thing at ABA uh, or at BIS. Yep. He'll be there. Um, yeah. There will be Lance Rosa. Uh, a bunch of attorney slash veterinarians are going to be discussing this because these are some important topics for us to tackle. And I think that's an organization that's well suited to ar arrange this. I've been on the examining board in Wisconsin for seven years. So I got a pretty good handle on this. That's great. Thank you. And then I'm going to yeah. go back and do some more surgery. So, so. <laughs> I love it. That's great. I know. Bless her heart. She was so patient going, ah, ah, but me, 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 let me talk. So good. Anyway, so good to add that. Some good, some good insight. So, um, Catherine just raised the little 25 minutes. So we are at the end of our 25 minutes. We, you know, always promise that if at the end of 25 minutes you need to depart and get on with your day, um, you can certainly do so. But I know Carrie has agreed to stay and continue this conversation for a little bit longer. So um, if for those of you who would like to stay, please do ask your questions and let's continue to engage. And for those of you who have to um, has have to hop off now, we want to just say thank you for joining us. And for those of you who have not tried yet to turn on your camera, we, we encourage you to do so as well. So <laughs> I know Steve is an electrician and that's okay. <laughs> it's so not scary. Don't, right? don't. <laughs> don't judge, right? We don't judge. We want to see your face. It's very important. Yeah. So. <laughs> now, even though Catherine and I spend hours putting our makeup on, getting ready for these things in advance, we don't expect any of you to do that ever. Just show up as you are. <laughs> Okay, kidding, of course. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. Right, so, so anyway, we didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation because it looked like, uh, you know, and Carrie, you were making some really great points. I think Martina made um, a good point about the fact that it's becoming so prevalent that the AVMLA is now spending the entire day talking about, you know, what some of the regulations are here. Um, I know many of us who are still on the call have a lot of other affiliations and associations, too, that, that lend some insight. So speak up. Comment, share, or not. Is Martina still there? Can she tell me when that conference is? I think she said it was Saturday, Friday and Saturday, Martina? Saturday and Sunday, I think. Saturday, Saturday. Okay. Saturday and Sunday. I, think it's, I, I don't know, whatever that Saturday and Sunday is. Yeah. Uh, okay, got it. You don't have to be a member to attend. We'd love to have you join us, and we'd love to have you become members. You don't have to be a veterinarian and an attorney. You can be one or the other or just interested. So we'd love to have more members and more attendance because this is an organization that can really move this subject forward. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in surgery, so I... <laughs> Hi, thank you. I love, I love, love, love. This was so important that she actually is with us during surgery. That we've had all kinds of things. We've had kids, we've had dogs, we've had babies, we've had you know spouses, um, <laughs> we've had delivery men, but we've not had surgery. In surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Two new yeah. things: cars and surgery. Yeah, cars, and cars, exactly. Cars. I'm going to do the horse next time, though. I promise. There you go. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I'd like to hear anybody else, any kind of uh, concerns or um, questions that you have, uh, next steps for all of us working in technology oh, to try to oh. deliver what veterinarians need and pet parents. Bruce, are you trying to speak? We can yes, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt Carrie. So um, next week I'm excited because I'm going down to a practice in Tampa, uh, yeah. Melissa Webster has implemented telehealth in her practice. And then there's a practice in Oklahoma that also has done it. Melissa's probably a little bit ahead of the curve than others. Yeah. So I'm gonna spend the day in her practice thinking about um, how to create a virtual exam room and then how to share that with um, veterinarians at ABMA. 
Yeah, Melissa's so. a good friend of mine. So um, she's using live DVM. We've been using PetSAM. So there's a lot. And every single veterinarian in the country has done telemedicine. They just haven't called it that. We all talk to a client on the phone, and that makes it telemedicine. Exactly. Exactly. And I think there's a lot of good platforms out there. And so you can be platform agnostic. And, you know, I think veterinarians need to choose a platform. But it's really about how do you implement that? Right? What are the policies and procedures that you put in place? How do you address associate veterinarians and their contracts when it comes to this? So on the surface, it seems pretty simple. And then when you start digging into it, you're like, oh, my goodness, we have to help help veterinarians and practice managers with some guidelines so that when they do select a technology provider, which I believe everybody, sh that should be the first thing you do, when they do make that selection, then they have some guideposts or guide rails to operate within. I love so the point that, okay. because that, I'm sorry, but this really, to me, this all ties back, right? The whole telehealth trend, as well as the medical records, because at any given moment, if you're connecting with someone, um, you know, online about your pet's health, you should be able to send right over the background and the information on, on that pet. I mean, if we owned it, we could do that. Yeah, the, but there's a bigger question here. Sorry for the plane <laughs> on, on the airport. <laughs> yeah. um, so the bigger question is, what comprises the medical record and how do you keep it unified? Because the, what I see in a lot of telehealth applications and a lot of PIMS do not do a great job connecting it. Um, some do, some don't. Um, so then you're stuck keeping records over here, texts over here. A lot of people still use text as asynchronous telehealth. Um, and you've got the, the PIMS and then you've got so, so there are some platforms like I think Babel, that's a good example that we connect into the PIMS and, but we're kind of an additional medical record pulling in all the connected health stuff into one platform. So those platforms become more and more important as you try to decide what a unified um, record is. And that's an interesting question, too. So who should, who should decide what is in that unified record? Is it, is it an AHA for their member hospitals, for example? Is this something AVMA should get involved with? Or should there be guidelines that are general and then practices accept on their own. I mean, that, that brings a whole new can of worms, right, to discuss in this, in this area. There are some state, states that are pretty specific about what is a medical record um, in their practice acts, and there are some states that are really vague. So it's, uh, it's all over the board. It's a medic I've read every single medical record one years ago when I was um, working on that, but we um, should probably revisit uh, the medical records piece of the states. But I think more importantly, develop, I think any conversation after a VCPR that you have with the client is considered part of the medical record. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's also um, interesting to pull in other pieces of care that are happening um, so you can advise. So when she started advising the groomer on how to take care of the ears, that there's an ear infection, are you, don't you need to understand what the groomer is doing and how to communicate that and doesn't that become part of the medical record? Um, so very, very interesting how we pull this ecosystem together in the long run. And, and I, just to build on that, I think there's two trends that we're seeing in the, in the market space. So there is, Carrie, what you said, which is housing in a, in a cloud solution that collects everything, which seems to make a lot of sense, but then the two big providers in the space have both publicly announced that they're creating API, global APIs, and that will have the ability for both read and write back. Now, the functionality doesn't exist for on-premise right now in, a, in every single case to write back, but write back is starting to happen. A lot of times, unauthorized write back is what's happening now into software but certainly the two big providers are going to, and they could be doing it now, and I just don't know about it, but they'll do authorized right back into the medical record. Interesting. Julie and Stacy, I noticed you guys have unmuted. Did you have comments you wanted to make or were you? Well, I'm just wondering if something like this could be tied into the microchips. You know, the client could have that number um, to give 
if they're going to call in or something. Um, another provider has the scanners. They can dump into a central database type of thing. You, yes, uh, you have to have um, the permission of the client to access, um, uh, you know, that information. I, certainly not just the address and phone number, that's kind of public knowledge, but the rest of the um, personal information you might be accessing. So the only problem with a microchip is the dog might get lost and somebody scans it and then suddenly has access to all that information. Um, it should be the client just shares it. Um, so there is a, you know, sort of, I'll give you an example. The only one I know out there is, so, so I'm not trying to be commercial, but the only one that, I, that I've seen out there is, so Babel, so with Babel Bark, you, if you lose your pet, you send a message out called an Amber Alert and all the shelters, veterinarians, and anybody else with Babel Bark knows, but it's driven from the client. So my dog's lost. Do you find it? This is my information and where I live. Um, so you can get a hold of me right away or my phone number usually. Um, so, uh, you know, it, but it happens instantaneously rather than you having to get on the phone. I've lost my dog for the last six months and that is, that takes pretty much hours to try to, to do all that um, yourself. But, you know, good point. I mean, microchip is, I think microchip is a great way to have a, an identification of a pet that's like a social security number for us. And that's the problem is patient matching when you're, when you're sharing records from multiple sources. So the, I think that's a great use of a microchip as a more unified um, a, a validation that that's the same Maybe pet. it's even a, a opt-in, you know, for the, the pet parent to do that when they're filling out the application for the microchip. Yeah, yeah we're gonna share this number whenever somebody scans it because um, most of the time if somebody's going to scan it and has a scanner, it's going to be a shelter or veterinarian, right? Yeah. So, um, so it's going to be for a good cause. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good solution to that. Stacy, did you have a comment? Oops, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I was just, as Carrie was talking and there's nobody better than Carrie to take this on. Carrie, I, I remember when you did the reciprocity, I was on that journey with you. So I'm <laughs> glad you're doing this. But I was just thinking through this conversation about my own personal experience with medical records when a doctor of mine sold his practice to a hospital and just not being able to get my medical records very easily was a very frustrating experience for me. And it just took a lot of hoops for me to get them. So I'm just I think this is a great cause. I'm glad you're you're working hard to let the medical records belong to the patient. Well, thank you. In this case, the client, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was a fun fun battle, right? It was a, it was a real battle, and it was a real test of proprietary. Somebody asked that question early on in the in the talk is, it, is, is this because we want to keep those clients, they're ours, we own them, you know, and, I, and certainly the culture has completely changed. So we don't own the clients. They are free to go anywhere. They are going to choose us because of our experience um, and the experience that we give them, the client experience. So, um, yeah, so we have to figure out how to, how to make those most portable. This kind of became a pet project. I'm, I'm on the interoperability committee for um, Association for Veterinary Informatics and searching for, you know, there are some really good standards out there, but technology is changing now so rapidly that the biggest standard we have to be worried about is patient matching. Uh, when you start sharing records within different providers that you've actually got the right pet. We, we had a uh, patent in Banfield on that, and that toughest part of that whole project for record sharing is matching that that's the same client because you know they give my husband's name is different than mine my last name you know they might he might spell that our dog's names differently right <laughs> when he goes into a different um, hospital so um you know that that'll be there'll be lots of technical challenges um but i think i think it's really great this is less controversial than i thought it would be honestly and so i just want to make a note that we are coming up on 40 minutes in um and getting kind of near the end of our time. So I just want last minute call for comments or questions and then we'll ask Carrie to kind of wrap us up with a little summary or final thought. So well, I'll, say, I'll say one, one thing, uh, Carrie, and to the, to the group. You know, veterinarians, I think, have to change. We've realized that. We're gonna have to 
do away with the thought process, as you pointed out, that they are our clients and only our clients and we own them. That's gone away. As far as I'm concerned in my practices, you know, the client has the choice to go wherever they want to. And when we get records in from another veterinarian, we do just what you're talking about. We identify that pet, we identify that with that client. We then scan every one of those records into a medical record uh, in our hospital. Then what we do is we share that with the client, that that is their medical record. We send that back to them right then and there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a first step, understanding we're not in competition with the guy down the street. We're in competition with ourselves. If we provide a better experience for the client, they're not going anywhere else. Yeah, that's really progressive. That's, that's great. really well said. Yeah, competition with ourselves. We're, we're our own yeah. worst enemies. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's great. Right. Carrie, any final thoughts? Okay, so final thoughts are just, you know, thank you guys all for, this has been very engaging. And I think Danny actually wrapped it up pretty well. Um, I think <laughs> there's a lot of um, change coming. Um, and I, and I think uh, I've just been amazed at how rapidly veterinarians are actually starting to respond to the change um, this time around. I think a lot of other change we've been resistant. And I think because the economy overall is changing and our experience with banking and all that else is changing, our minds are opening a little bit more. And um, I think it's going to be uh, pretty exciting. Uh, and I learned about a new meeting to go to, which I really look up. <laughs> Good. It's great to get everybody together and we want to thank everyone again for coming. Um, if, if you didn't hear Catherine early on, we're holding two fun events at um, the AVMA conference for those of you who are coming. I know some of you have already RSVP'd, yay. Um, we've got Bourbon with the Bridge Club on Friday night the 13th which is just a gathering of um, Bridge Club members or prospective members to kind of network and chat. And then on Monday um, the 16th of July we are hosting our first ever veterinary industry icon event, and we are introducing um, Kristen Peck, who is the executive VP and, and um, US president of Zoetis Animal Health as our first ever Bridge Club industry icon. So there will be a fun event where um, Kristen will talk with us a little bit about her own journey and uh, people get to mingle a little bit too. So if you're having fun here and you're available on either of those nights at the AVMA, we would love to see your faces in person. And um, if not, we hope to see you again soon on another Bridge Club event. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for hosting, Jess. And cheers, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Mm -hmm.